At this point, uh, we are going to be, we're continuing this sermon series that we have been in called What's Love Called uh, Got to Do With It. And uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 9. And as I do sometimes, I want to read this passage ahead of time just so we sort of get to lay the land and then we'll pray and then we'll continue on here. But uh, we'll have these words on the screen. This is during the ministry of Jesus. And this is what it says. It says, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw that th- this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. We'll stop right there. Let's just have a brief prayer here. Father, we just thank you so much again for the opportunity to just look into your word, Lord. And I pray as we look at this passage here today, God, I pray that you would speak through me. I pray that you'd speak through your word, Father. And I pray that you would just help us to see your heart uh, for people, God, and the heart that we are to have as well. And so we just thank you in advance for what you're going to do. And we ask all this in your son's name. Amen. Well, as we begin here today, a couple weeks ago, I got the opportunity to go on a really fun trip with my son, Lucas. So Lucas, if you can believe it, he is, uh, he's my oldest. He is actually finishing up fourth grade this year. He's 10 years old, going into fifth grade next year. And Lucas goes to Friends Christian School here. And in fourth grade here in California, uh, the, the kids, they learn about California history and the gold rush and the missions and that sort of thing. So at Friends Christian every year, the fourth grade class, they take a trip to Sacramento. Sacramento and San Francisco so that they can see firsthand some of the places that they've learned about during the year. And so Lucas, he got to go on this trip a couple of weeks ago and I got to go with him. And as you can imagine, it was just an awesome experience. In fact, we'll put a picture on the screen of my son and I in front of the Golden Gate Bridge on the last day of the trip. If you can even see the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, San Francisco is notorious for its fog. But there you see my son, Lucas, he's getting big as you can see. And uh, yeah, we just had a great time, a lot of great memories. And I got to tell you, it was it was, it was really interesting to be back in San Francisco on the last day of that trip because it was the last first time since uh, 2006, actually, since I lived in San Francisco that I had ever stepped foot back in the city again. And so it was a real trip to go back to a city that had marked such a definitive and if I can say it, such a miserable time in my life. Those were not a fun couple of years. But when I was in San Francisco a few weeks ago, I felt like God brought to mind Uh, Something that occurred when I first lived there. Uh, This was 2005, I think it was, something like that, middle of the year. And in the middle of 2005, uh, there was uh, actually a big hotel worker strike in San Francisco. Uh, A lot of the workers were on strike protesting for better benefits and higher wages and that sort of thing. And my apartment in San Francisco was actually right next door to a Marriott. It was right next door to a hotel. And so for like two weeks straight, every single day, from morning until night, uh, the sidewalk right outside of my apartment was just filled with, with hotel workers protesting and yelling and chanting for higher wages and that sort of thing. And I could hear them really, really well from my apartment. Well, I remember this, this happened one weekend and uh, it was a weekend I happened to have off. And so it was like a Saturday night, a Saturday afternoon, something like that. And I was in my apartment by myself and I think I was listening to worship music, if I remember correctly. And I was just spending some time praying, praying for, you know, my, my life and praying for, I felt like God was calling me to ministry and praying for that and so on. And as I was praying, I could hear the chanting of these hotel workers. And so I I felt compelled in that moment. I, I felt compelled to pray for them. And so I said to God something like this. I said, God, how can I help these hotel workers? God, what can I do? for these these people out there. And I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase, be careful what you pray for, (laughs) but this was definitely one of those instances because I, I really believe that in that moment, God spoke to me and he told me what to do. Now, I won't say that I heard the audible voice of God, but nevertheless, it was unmistakable. And I felt like God said to me in that moment, Chris, you wanna help these hotel workers? Well, go and tell them about my son, Jesus. You want to help these hotel workers right now? Get out of your apartment and go downstairs and tell them about me. That's how you can help those hotel workers. And if this freaks you out a little bit, trust me, it freaked me out even more. And that's why, although I would love to tell you 
that in that moment I obeyed God and I got out of my apartment and I told these hotel workers about Jesus and I led them all to Christ and I started the great hotel worker revival in San Francisco of 2005, uh, I can't lie to you men and women. No, you know what, instead, you know what I did? I chickened out. I stayed in my apartment. I disobeyed God in that moment and I kept the message of Jesus to myself. Well, when I was in San Francisco a couple of weeks ago, I felt like God, as I said, brought that situation to mind. And as I was thinking about it, there, there was a question that I had and the question was, what if? What if? What if I hadn't chickened out in that moment? What, what if I'd obeyed the clear call that God had given me in that moment? What would have happened as a result of that? Well, I'm sad to say that I will never know the answer to that question this side of heaven. But I'll tell you what, when I was up in San Francisco a couple of weeks ago, I resolved never to make that mistake again. You know, in this uh, series that we're in on relationships called What's, What's Love Got to Do With It? Today, we're going to talk about what I think is one of the most important and yet I think also one of the most neglected relationships that we, uh, we have in our life. And that is our relationship with our neighbor. And by that, I mean anybody that, that is in our life that crosses our path on a regular basis, whether it be people in our work, people at school, people in our neighborhood, wherever. But we're going to be talking about the responsibility that God has given us towards the people that cross our path on a daily basis. You know, if you've been here for a while, one of the things that you know about me is you know that I do not believe in accidents. No, I believe that at any given moment, we are where we are for a reason. And I believe one of the major reasons that God has for us where we are at any given moment is because of the people that are around us. You see, I believe that God has sovereignly placed people around us in our lives for a very specific purpose. It's because these are the people that God wants us to share the good news of Jesus with. These are the people that God wants us to be a light for Jesus for. And I believe this is more than just a desire that God has for us. I actually believe this is a responsibility that God has given us. We have been given as Christians a responsibility to show love to our neighbors. And I believe the greatest way that we do that is by sharing Jesus with them. But like many things in the Christian faith, for many Christians, this is something that is easier said than done. In fact, I would argue that there are few things that we are asked to do as Christians that make Christians more uncomfortable and more nervous than when we think about sharing Jesus with the people around us. In fact, I think I may have shared with you that comic I came across a couple of years ago. And it's a comic of two guys that are standing at a bus stop. And one guy is wearing a t-shirt that says in big, bold letters, it says, let's talk about Jesus. And the other guy's a little confused by that. And so he asked the guy wearing the t-shirt, he says, why are you wearing that? And the guy wearing the t-shirt says something like this. He says, well, it guarantees me a seat all to myself on the bus. <laughs> and that's the case, isn't it? There are few things that make us Christians more uncomfortable. There are few things that make the world out there more uncomfortable than when we talk about Jesus. But I'll tell you what, as uncomfortable as it makes us men and women, it is not something that we can ignore as God's people. Simply put, to be a Christian is to be an ambassador for Jesus. To be a Christian is to be a person who resolves not to keep the message of Jesus to ourselves, but to be a Christian is to be a person who resolves to share that message of Jesus with others. After all, isn't that the example that Jesus left for us? Isn't that what Jesus modeled for us? Well, absolutely it is. And that's what we see in this passage we're taking a look at today. You know, this passage I read just a minute ago, it is a very simple passage. At its center is this dinner that Jesus has with, as we'll see, some unlikely characters. And it's all about the controversy that this dinner causes. And it's all about the response that Jesus has to that controversy. But as simple as this passage is, it is chock full of lessons for us about the calling that God has given us to share Jesus with those around us. So what I wanna do here today is I wanna get hopefully very practical with you. And I wanna use this passage to share with us a few lessons that this passage teaches us about reaching out to G with Jesus to our neighbors. And so here's what I want you to do. If you like to take notes, I want you to get out a piece of paper or the notes app on your phone, however you wanna do it. And at the top of that paper, at the top of that notes app, I want you to write this phrase. It's loving our neighbor means dot, dot, dot. Okay, loving our neighbor means dot, dot, dot. 
And then what I'm gonna do throughout this message is I'm gonna give you a few statements to fill in that particular phrase right there. And the first one's gonna come at you right away. And that is this, loving our neighbor means recognizing their spiritual needs before anything else. Loving our neighbor means recognizing their spiritual needs before anything else. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let me explain. As we take a look at this passage in Matthew chapter 9, we're going to pick it up towards the end of this passage, verse 12. Don't worry, we'll cover the other verses in a little bit, but I want to pick it up at the end. As I said, Jesus is having a dinner with some unlikely characters. In fact, Matthew calls them in this passage point blank. He calls them sinners, which means that these are some of the more unseemly members of society at this time. In fact, it's not unreasonable to think that there are prostitutes at this dinner. It's not unreasonable to think that there are drunk people and people who are getting drunk at this dinner. There may even be criminals, former thieves, people who have just been let, released from prison at this particular dinner. And we're told the Pharisees, the religious leaders of this day, they're made very uncomfortable by the fact that Jesus is having a dinner with these sorts of people. And so they start complaining. And Jesus hears about their complaining and look at Jesus' response, verse 12. It says this, it says, on hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Stop right there. And for our purposes, I want to read verse 12 because at least for this first point, that's the key. Middle of the verse, Jesus says this. He says, it's not the healthy who need the do a doctor, but the sick. And I want to let you know how important of a statement this is. You see, one of the reasons why the Pharisees are so upset that Jesus is having this dinner with these sinners is the Pharisees believe that by eating with these people, what Jesus is doing is he is saying by his actions that he approves of their behavior. That by eating with these prostitutes and drunkards and the like, that Jesus is saying that what these people are doing is okay. And that makes the Pharisees very uncomfortable. Well, what Jesus makes clear here in verse 12 is that that is not at all what he is saying. You see, what does Jesus liken himself to in verse 12? Well, he likens himself to a doctor, right? And what does he liken those that he is eating dinner with? Well, he likens the, those people to people who are sick. And obviously there is an analogy that Jesus is making here. And the analogy that Jesus is making is, listen, in the same way that a doctor doesn't meet with sick people to affirm them in their sickness, but instead to make them better, Jesus isn't eating with these sinners because he approves of what they're doing. No, he's eating with these sinners as a way to pull them out of their sin. He's eating with these sinners as a way to get them to stop sinning, to make them better. And if you sort of take this statement and kind of like zoom out on it for a little bit, you understand that, that Jesus is making a larger point here about the spiritual state that people are in when he is not in their lives. And what is that point? Well, what Jesus is saying is he is saying that when he is not in their lives, people are sick, spiritually speaking. They are suffering from a spiritual illness. And what Jesus is making clear is that he is the only one who has the ability to heal them. And what I want you to understand, men and women, is that it's not until we truly get that, it's not until we truly grasp that, that we will ever be able to love our neighbors in the way that God wants us to. You know, I know one of the reasons why we don't like to share Jesus with other people. One of the reasons why we don't like to share Jesus with other people is because we are afraid of offending people. We're afraid of making people upset. We're afraid of, of, of having people think less of us. And many of us know that when we start talking about Jesus with other people, that's exactly what happens. And so it's for that reason we often will keep the message of Jesus to ourselves, even keep it from our closest friends, right? But friends, do you understand how unloving that really is? You know, speaking of doctors here, I was thinking this past week, you know, th this past week, it marks almost exactly two years ago to the day that my wife and I found news that would dramatically impact our life. And that's because almost exactly two years ago to the day, my, my wife found a lump in her breast that would lead her to being diagnosed with stage two breast cancer. And I'll tell you what, men and women, it, it was really difficult hearing that news. It was really difficult hearing that my wife had a tumor inside of her that if left unchecked could have killed her. 
And everything involved in, in getting rid of that tumor was difficult. The surgery was difficult. The, the radiation was difficult. The recovery was difficult. All of that was difficult. But do you know what would have been even more difficult? Well, what would have been even more difficult? What would have been even harder is if we hadn't found out about that tumor two years ago. Because if we hadn't found out about that tumor, who knows where my wife would be today? I mean, I shudder to think at what would have happened to her. And that's why I was thinking this past week. I mean, can, can you imagine if our doctor, can you imagine if he had acted towards us the way that we Christians often act towards others? In other words, can you imagine if for fear of disappointing us or for fear of making us upset at him or for fear of, of offending us, if our doctor had decided to keep my wife's cancer diagnosis to himself, I mean, that would have been terrible, right? Well, listen, that's the perspective that we need to take to people around us. You see, here's the reality according to God's word, okay? The reality according to God's word, men and women, is that without Jesus, we're sick. Without Jesus, each and every one of us, we have a tumor growing inside of us, and it is the tumor of sin. And it is not a stage two tumor, it is a stage four tumor. It is metastasized, it is spread throughout our body. And unless people do something about it, they will face a fate even worse than death. They will face eternal separation from God. And I know that's a little bit heavy, but you know what? I feel like as God's people, we need to feel the weight of that from time to time. We need to feel the weight of the dire spiritual situation that people are in without Jesus. Because it's not until we feel the weight of that that we will ever be compelled to do something about it. And what is it that we are asked to do about the situation that people are in? Well, that's the second lesson that we get from this passage. And that is this, loving our neighbor means engaging and not retreating. Loving our neighbor means engaging and not retreating. You know, I know another reason why we Christians don't like to share Jesus with those around us. And the other reason why we Christians don't like to share Jesus with those around us is not just because we're afraid of offending people. I think it's also because these days a lot of Christians are just plain afraid of other people. You know, I think it's obvious to me at times it feels like we are living in a world where a number of people are increasingly turning away from the values and the principles that God's word teaches that we hold too dear, dearly as Christians. And especially in California, right? At times it feels like there are even people who are trying to make it illegal to believe what we believe and to practice what we practice. And I know one of the temptations in situations like that. And the temptation for us Christians is to want to insulate. The temptation for us Christians is to want to hunker down and to only associate with other Christians, to only associate with other people who act and look and think and believe like we do. In other words, the temptation that a lot of Christians feel right now is let's just all move to Nashville, right? <laughs> let's just move to this magical land that apparently only Christians move to and it's just this wonderful place where we kumbaya and it's all Christians and all that sort of stuff. And that's the temptation right now. The temptation is only to surround ourselves with other Christians. But what's the problem with that? Well, the problem with that is exactly what I just said. If the world out there is sick and if we are the only people who have what can heal them, don't we have a responsibility towards them? Don't we have a responsibility to engage with them and to point them to Jesus, the only one who can heal them? Well, absolutely we do. And that's what Jesus models for us in this passage. Look with me at verses nine and 10. Look at how all this begins. It says this, it says, as Jesus went out from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. Stop right there. And there are a couple of things going on in those verses. First of all, we see Jesus call as one of his 12 disciples, as one of his inner circle of closest followers, a tax collector by the name of Matthew. And you have to understand how shocking this would have been in the first century. You see, in the first century, by and large, Jewish people, they hated tax collectors. And that's because they saw tax collectors as traitors and they saw tax collectors as crooks. And for the most part, they were. 
You see, first of all, tax collectors were traitors. To be a tax collector in the first century, you had to work for the Roman government. And in the Jewish perspective, the Roman government was literally the government of Satan. It was an evil empire. And to be a tax collector, therefore, was to sell your soul to the enemy. And so tax collectors were considered to be traitors. And not only that, tax collectors were often crooks. The way that tax collectors made their money in their first century is they would overcharge their clients so that they could pocket the rest. That's why no self-respecting Jewish person in the first century would ever willingly choose to be a tax collector. And yet for whatever reason, that's what this Jewish man, Matthew, chose as his profession. And what was Jesus' response to him? Jesus chose this traitor, this crook, to be one of his closest of disciples. That's crazy, men and women. That would be like Jesus today choosing a mob boss to be his disciple, okay? It's absolutely insane. And that's what leads to the other thing that is going on in this passage. And that is this dinner. Because after Matthew is chosen by Jesus, he decides to throw a party. He decides to throw a dinner and he invites his friends. And that's where the prostitutes and the drunkards and the other tax collectors come from. And he invites Jesus and his disciples to be a part of this dinner. And Jesus and his disciples attend. And you have to understand how crazy that was. Because you see, in the first century, dinners were more than just dinners. They were networking events. They were events that were deliberately used to help you climb the social ladder. That's why, for, for that reason, it would have been social suicide in Jesus' day for Jesus to attend this dinner. In fact, from the world's point of view, Jesus had everything to lose and he had nothing to gain by being at this dinner. And yet, even still, he went. Why? Well, the answer is clear. Because when there's a pandemic going on, doctors aren't called to isolate. Doctors are called to engage. When there's a worldwide sickness going on, nurses aren't called to retreat. They're called to get out in the world and they're called to help people. I mean, think back to COVID. You know, as bad as COVID was, can you imagine if during COVID, all the doctors and all the nurses and all the medical professionals, if they got scared, so they just decided to stay home instead of go to their jobs and help people? Or worse, can you imagine if all the doctors decided to move to Nashville? I mean, how terrible would that be, right? No, when there is a pandemic going on, doctors can't retreat. They have to get out there and they have to help people. And so do we. You know, every Wednesday night, I take my, my, my kids, I take them to Chick-fil-A for dinner because my wife, she teaches an online class and so we gotta get out of the house and so we go to Chick-fil-A. And whenever we go to Chick-fil-A, my two girls, they spend a lot of time in the play area of Chick-fil-A. That's actually one of the reasons that we go. I don't know if you know this, but like all the fast food joints, they all got rid of play areas, right? Well, Chick-fil-A is holding strong, so we, we go there. And when my, my girls go to the, the play area, do you know what, what question my girls ask pretty much every single kid and every single parent for that matter who walks into the play area? Well, they ask every single kid and every single parent, no joke, they ask them whether or not they know Jesus. They ask them whether or not they believe in God. And then once they find the answer, they run out and they tell me the intel and they tell me how many Christians are in the play area at any given moment. <laughs> And I'll be honest with you, men and women, I, I get a little embarrassed by that at times, you know? But you know what? I'm so proud of my daughters for doing that. And I hope they never stop doing that. Because even though they're only seven and almost six years old, they realize that they're doctors. They realize to a certain extent the spiritual state that people are in if they don't know Jesus. And so rather than retreat, they engage. And that's what we're called to do as well. Men and women, now is not the time to hunker down, okay? Now is not the time to decide that we're only gonna associate with people who think and believe just like we do. No, as we said, people are sick, spiritually speaking, and we are the doctors, we are the nurses. Now is not the time to quarantine. No, now is the time to get out there and to pay attention to the people that God has put in our path who don't know Jesus, and now is the time to engage with them, to reach out to them. And so I ask you, who are those people in your life? We all have them. There are people in our neighborhood, there are people at our school, there are people at work, there are people that we run into at the coffee shop, there are people that we run into the supermarket and the gym. They're not there by accident. They have been placed there by God because they are the ones that God has sovereignly called us to show the love of Jesus to. So who has God put in your life? 
Now, I know what some of you are thinking, but Chris, some of those people are a little weird. Some of those people are a little strange. Some of those people I have nothing in common with. Am I really supposed to reach out to them? Well, here's my answer to that question. What did Jesus have in common with a tax collector? Nothing. And yet he still reached out to him. And I think there's something to be said about that. You see, I think one of the reasons why Jesus was so quick to associate with sinners is because it's often those who have been rejected by the rest of the world who are most open to the accepting message and love of Jesus Christ. And so I ask you, who are those people in your life? Who's the guy at work that doesn't seem to have any friends? Who's the kid at school who's always eating lunch by themselves? Who is the the mom of your kid's friends that always seems to be on the outside? You know who I'm talking about, the one that doesn't seem to fit in with the rest of you. Those may be the very people that God is specifically calling you to. If they don't know Jesus, they're spiritually sick. And they're no less in need of a doctor than anybody else. And they're the people that God wants us to share the good news of Jesus with. And once we have identified those people, how do we reach out to them? How do we share Jesus with them? Well, that's my third point, and that is this. Loving our neighbor means seeking relationship with people instead of speaking condemnation to them. It means seeking relationship with people instead of speaking condemnation to them. And here's what I mean by this. You know, once we recognize the need that people have... And once we decide to engage with them rather than retreat from them, there's going to be a temptation that we feel. And the temptation that we feel is immediately we're going to want to expose people's sin and desperation apart from Jesus. The temptation we'll feel is to immediately let people know how condemned they are without Jesus. And there are some people who take this route. These are the people who stand on street corners with large signs that says, believe in Jesus, repent, and go to hell, and that sort of, or, or go to hell, and that sort of thing. And listen, I understand why some people would take that route, okay? But I'm not sure that that's the example that Jesus sets for us, at least in this passage. You know, it strikes me in this passage that although Jesus is eating with people that by his own admission, he calls them sinners, he calls them sick, I don't see Jesus condemn anybody in this passage. And so what does he do? He just shares a meal with them. He just invites them into relationship with him. And Jesus makes reference to that. End of verse 13, Jesus says this. He says, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And what I love about that verse is the Greek word that is translated called there is just a normal Greek word for invite. In other words, you could translate that verse, for I have not come to invite the righteous, but sinners. And what is the language of invitation? It's the language of relationship. And I think that's the predominant way that God wants us to share Jesus with people. It's to invite them into a relationship with us so that they can meet Jesus through us. You see, here's what I believe. I don't believe the vast majority of us are going to be called by God to stand on a street corner with a sign and yell things about Jesus into a bullhorn. Now, I do believe God calls some people to do that, so don't judge those people but I don't think that's what God will call the vast majority of us to do. No, I think God just calls the vast majority of us to to just enter into relationship with the people in our lives who don't know Jesus. To show love to them, to care for them, to be a good neighbor to them, to, to invite them over to a meal, yes. Because over time, if we do that, what will happen is we will give people a different picture of us and a different picture of Jesus and they get on the internet and they get on the nightly news and over time, what's gonna happen is people's hearts are gonna begin to soften and that will provide us a perfect opportunity to talk about Jesus with them. I've seen that happen in my own life. I think of of one of my neighbors, and I mean literally one of my neighbors. She lives in my neighborhood. And we have this neighbor. She is a wonderful woman. She's a sweet woman. She's not a Christian, however. And she actually, when she first moved into our neighborhood years ago, she was really opposed to anything related to Christianity. In fact, she would not even say Merry Christmas to us. That's how against these things she was. Well, over the years, my wife and I, we have just tried to be Jesus to her. And we've tried to love her because we do. And over time, we've seen some changes. I mean, she went from not wanting to say Merry Christmas to us to last Christmas, she gave us a Christmas present on Christmas Day and said Merry Christmas to us as she gave it to us. And most significantly, not too long ago, one of her adult sons was going through a difficult circumstance. Well, she knows what my wife and I do, so she called us up. She asked if we could meet with him. We did. We encouraged him. We supported him. We gave him advice. Yes, we shared Jesus with him. And when all was said and done, she thanked us for the impact that we were able to have in her son's life. Now, is my neighbor a Christian yet? No, she's not. But who knows what will happen? You see, believe it or not, it's not our responsibility to get someone to believe in Jesus. Our responsibility is simply to share Jesus, to be Jesus, and leave the results up to God. And that is what our world needs right now. You know, if I can say it, I think we Christians, I think we kind of have a bad reputation right now in the world. And I think some of that bad reputation has been earned. 
because there have been some vocal Christians out there who, if I can say it, have been very annoying recently. And I think some of us Christians, we've forgotten the simple example of Jesus who had abundant truth, yes, but he also had abundant mercy and grace and love, especially for those that the rest of the world casts off. And Jesus calls us to have the same. That's what he says in verse 13 when he says this. He says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. See that there? I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And there Jesus is quoting an Old Testament passage, Hosea 6.6. And in the book of Hosea, God is mad at the Jewish people because they are constantly offering sacrifices on the altar every day but they're forgetting to show love to their neighbors. And what Jesus is saying by using that verse is he's saying, listen, don't get so caught up in following religious rules that you forget to show love. Or said another way, don't get so caught up in being right that you forget to be kind. And we need to remember that as well. Let's not get so caught up in being right and loud and vocal that we fail to show love to those around us. That's why I'm excited about the special guests that we have with us here this weekend. Those of you who have been here for a while, you know that once a month we take a special offering for ministries in our area that we just believe are doing a lot of good for Jesus. And today we have one of those ministries. It's a ministry called Charity on Wheels. And this ministry is doing exactly what Jesus talks about in this passage. And so we thought as inspiration for us today, we would bring the founder of that ministry, Zach Southall, up with us to share a little bit how, about how they are being Jesus to those in need. So would you do me a favor right now? Would you give a very warm Friends Church welcome to Zach Southall as he takes the stage? Hey, Zach, thank you so much for being with us here today. Oh, thanks so much for having me. So we have been talking about, as you know, reaching out to our neighbors with the love of Jesus. And several years ago, you started an organization that did just that. Can you tell us a little bit about Charity on Wheels, maybe a little bit about how it was started and, and what you've seen God do through it? Well, Charity on Wheels, for those of you who don't know, is a homeless outreach. Um, we, our whole mission is to, in Jesus' name, rescue and restore people who are struggling with poverty and homelessness, uh, to get people off the street and get them self-reliant again. Um, so we're, we're very, very, very different from, from many other organizations in the space in that we don't just give people stuff. Um, we just love them much, much more than that. Uh, too much to just do that and walk away. Um, and we're not content to just uh, make people feel a little bit better living in their squalor. Uh, we really want to rescue and restore and transform lives. That's what we're all about. So um, our methodologies are very different. Everything uh, happens in the context of relationships. So we do that through consistency. So consistency uh, with our week-to-week -week outreaches, whether that's street outreach, we do street outreach every week, or um, different gatherings, support gatherings that we do at our facility and at partner facilities. And you guys have been a big part of all of this. You guys, so many uh, folks from from Friends Church have come and served and come every week and serve, whether it's with street outreach with me or um, at, at our other uh, uh, support gatherings, you guys have made a huge difference. And I, I just want to thank you. Thank you for being there. You guys are fantastic. This is, you guys are my favorites. I love you guys. <laughs> you guys are just awesome. You, uh, you said something, uh, I think in the service last night, you said, uh, we don't give a hand out, but a hand up, right? Explain what that correct, means. Correct. Correct. So, it's, it's, um, it's difficult to get off the street. It's really hard. Um, and, there, and the thing that nobody wants to talk about is there's, there's folks who are content to live on the street, yeah. live the way that they're doing. Um, so we have to focus on those folks who are ready to make a change. Um, and that, that happens over time. You know, again, that consistency is key. If I'm, if I'm meeting with you every week, let's say, and you're, you're living on the street, um, that consistency of relationship and that I'm building that relationship over time enables me to hopefully, you know, the goal is to have a pivotal conversation with you where I can say, hey, Chris, I can't stomach the thought of you spending another night out here. Can we put a plan together yeah, yeah. to get you out of here, to get you off the street? So um, that hand up, not a hand out, you know, we're, that, that's where that focus comes from. We're, yeah. we're constantly, even in, whether it's our, um, our support gatherings, you know, we're do, doing our, our different gatherings during the week where we have what looks like this in a lot of ways. You know, there's music, there's a message, there's teaching, the word of God is being preached, uh, and there's, just, there's food and resources in yeah. addition, you know, but through that we can, we can gather folks together and we can pick from that group who might be ready for a change, you know, because not everyone's ready. And that's okay. You know, we're still going to be there consistently reaching out. But when they are ready, we want to be ready as well in that we can 
pick them up and go very, very fast, yeah. whatever that looks like. And I'm sure you've seen so many life transformation stories over the 13 years, right? 13 yeah. years, yeah, 13 years. Can, can you share with this. us maybe one, especially that stands out of a life that's just been transformed by what you guys do? Absolutely. I'm, I'm such a lucky guy. Again, we, I keep mentioning this because we, we had talked about it initially, uh, um, I think it was last night, about who has the better job. <laughs> Chris or me, I have the better job, I think, but I, I, he thinks he has the better job. In that I, I get to be the, the hero in someone else's story every week. You know, I, I've, I could tell you stories every week. I'm sure anybody who's come and volunteered a few times at Charity on Wheels uh, could tell you the same thing. They get to witness incredible transformations and they get to play a part in God's plan in terms of being his hands and feet and transforming lives. And that's it's, it's, it's humbling and it's, and it's fantastic at the same time. So I, I think the person I would point to uh, now, just because he's here today and we can all embarrass him, is Big John. He's out at the booth out there. He's our manager at our facility in Anaheim. And uh, he's a guy that I met, you know, eight, nine, ten years ago uh, living on the street. He was in the riverbed and um, also at La Palma Park. Um, and his transformation, you know, what God's doing in him is, is awe-inspiring. It's very inspiring for me. So to see him go from the street to, you know, get him in a shelter and us walking with him that whole time and then into housing and now, and now work for us in that he's, he is now uh, that vehicle. He is now that guy reaching back uh, and pulling people up. And that's, that is absolutely amazing. He's been, he's been rescued, know, he's, he's the poster boy for us. He's been, he's been rescued, restored, equipped, and now he's back serving. You know, uh, awesome. what more could you ask for? There's All nothing right. more inspiring for me awesome. than that. Praise God. Make sure you say hi to Big John. <laughs> So as I said, we're going to be taking, as you leave today, a special offering. All of that money is going to go directly to Charity on Wheels. But is there any other way that we can support you here today? Well, as I said before, you guys, you know, you, a lot of you do a lot of things for us. And I, and I, I can't thank you enough, whether it's coming and serving in our kitchen or coming and, uh, you know, serving the meals or whatever, or actually going and being a little bit more hardcore and going out in street outreach or serving in our partner facilities, our partner shelters. You guys, a lot of you already come out. But I would encourage you, you know, obviously... We need money. We're not government funded. We don't take any money from anybody, really. We're all privately funded and we don't have any full-time staff. We're almost completely volunteer run. Um, so we, we have nothing but true believers. And I think that's why we're so effective and our system is so effective. Um, but I would encourage you to just stop by the booth. Stop by the booth out there in the pavilion and, and grab a flyer, you know, and, and maybe pray about it. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe pray about what you can do uh, to make a difference. We have so many places to plug in and, you know, the harvest is, is massive, but the workers are few. So, so please, please stop by and say hello. John, I love what you do, and thank you so much for being with us. Can we thank John for being with us here today? Zach, 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 Zach. Zach, 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 Zach. But Zach, say Zach. hi to John. <laughs> 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 Hey, as we, uh, as we wrap things up here today, as I was thinking about Zach's ministry and as I was thinking about this passage here today, I was thinking about our mission statement as a church, right? Becoming a community of authentic Christ followers compelled to change our world. And I was thinking especially about the last part of that mission statement, compelled to change our world. And I was asking myself the question this past week, how do we do that? How do we change our world? Well, the answer is right here. It's right in front of us. In fact, it reminds me of an illustration I've used a couple of times before. You know, I've often wondered what it would be like, brothers and sisters, if one day Jesus returned to this earth, not for a second coming, for, sort of for a preview to a second coming. And I've wondered what it'd be like if he would stand right here on the stage and he'd take the microphone and he'd say to all of us, he'd say, hey, anyone who wants to change the world for my sake, get up out of your seats, come and follow me. And I hope in that moment, every single one of us, we would get out of our seats and we would follow Jesus. And I imagine the excitement that we would feel as we started following him through the streets of Yorba Linda and Orange County, thinking about the, the places that he's going to lead us and the ways that we're going to change the world for his sake. And then I imagine that excitement turning to surprise maybe, and then even disappointment as one by one, Jesus would drop each and every one of us off the, at the front porches of the homes that we already live in, the schools that we already go to, the places that we already work. And without saying a word, he, word, he would turn around and he would walk away. And confused, we'd cry out to Jesus and we'd say, wait, Jesus, I thought you said I was going to change the world for your sake, but don't you understand? This is where I already live. This is where I already work. This is where I already go to school. What gives? And Jesus, he would turn around and with a smile on his face, he'd look at us and he'd say, exactly, exactly. I mean, how do you think you got here in the first place, my child? Did you think this was all your own doing? 
No, I'm the one who got this house for you. I'm the one who got this job for you. I'm the one who got you into this school. I orchestrated it all and I did it for a reason. You see, I placed you where you are because I surrounded you by people who did not know people, who know me. And they are people that I want you to share about me with. So you want to change the world? Tell them about me. That's how you change the world. One person at a time. And that is how we change the world. One person coming to Jesus at a time. And that's why my so what out of this message is really, really simple, men and women. And it's just this, just do it. Just do it. Every day we are surrounded by people who do not know Jesus. And they are there for a reason. They are people that God loves. They are people that God wants to be in a relationship with. And he wants to use us to make it happen. So let's just do it. As we go about our day, let's pay attention to the people that God has put in our life on a daily basis. And let's just start to get to know them. Start by getting to know their name. If you've already asked for their name before and you forgot, just apologize and ask for it again. Most people are understanding of that. Or if you don't wanna do that, do what a member of a small group I was once a part of did. He forgot the name of one of his neighbors, so he paid his kid 10 bucks to find out his neighbor's name. And I thought that was a great idea. Kids can get away with stuff like that. But then once you get to know their name, just start up a relationship with them. When you see them at the water cooler, ask how their day has been. When you're both walking out to your car together in the morning, ask them what they're excited about that day. Even offer to pray for them. Most people won't, don't, won't turn down and offer for prayer even if they're not a Christian. And just begin building those bridges. What's the worst that can happen? They don't wanna be in a relationship with you? Oh well. You doctors know that there are some people who are sick out there, they don't wanna get better. That's not your responsibility, that's their responsibility. But I think a lot more people will respond than we think. You know, if I had to do it all over again, brothers and sisters, I would have ran out of that apartment and I would have shared Jesus with those hotel workers in San Francisco. I cannot imagine how God could have used that moment in their lives. Well, listen, I can't go back and do that. But I can make a choice about what I do today. We all can. So let's be Jesus to the people that God has put around us. And let's change the world one person at a time. Amen. Amen. Will you stand with me, please, as we close? <laughs> Father God, we just thank you for loving us, Lord. We thank you, God, that you did for each and every one of us what Zach does for his ministry, God. And that is just reach out to us, God. You, you don't leave us where we are, Lord. You reach out to us. And the way that you do that, God, is you do that through other people who know you and love you. And God, you have compelled them to want to share the good news of Jesus with those around them. And so God, we pray that we would be that for other people, Lord. I pray, God, that right now you would light a fire within each and every one of us, God, that you would light a fire of just excitement and motivation just to begin to put into practice what we see your son Jesus do in this passage, just to begin reaching out and forming relationships, even with the most unlikely of people, Father. And God, that as we do that, we would just begin to see hearts soften, walls come down, God. And we would see openings and opportunities just to talk about our love for you, Lord. And God, that would translate into other people just wanting to get to know you the way that we know you, Father. And so God, I just pray that we would not keep the message of Jesus to ourselves, that we would not be complacent, God, but we would be excited and motivated to share about you with the people around us. And so God, as we close with this final moment of worship here, God, I just pray that you would use this song again just to light that fire within us, that flame within us, to wanna get out there and to wanna be Jesus and share Jesus to the world around us, God, and that you would use us to change the world one person at a time for the sake of your son, Jesus. And so God, we thank you for the honor and the privilege of being able to participate with you in your work and what you do, God. And we pray that we would take that seriously, Lord, and we would see again the world change as a result. We love you, Father. We thank you. And we ask all of this in the powerful name of your son, Jesus, and all God's people said, amen. <laughs>